Yeah, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Another exciting expert insight to come. And I tell you, the next topic is quite complex. It has to do with alloy. And this is why we are fortunate to get two experts to present their work to us here. For the expert insight, rapid alloy development for AM using automatic alloy screening methods and EHLA, I welcome on stage Klaus Büssenschütt, Materials Development Specialist from the RWTH Aachen University, and he has a chair for digital additive production. And we have Leonard Zeik, Senior Expert Extreme High Laser Application, ELA, Professor DAP, RWTH Aachen University. It's good to have you both on stage. Stage is yours, please. Thank you very much. Um, hello everyone, thank you for joining our talk today. My name is Klaus Bissenschitt and this is my colleague uh, Leonard Zeig and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, today we are going to talk about rapid alloy development for additive manufacturing and um, this talk is splitted. At first I will tell something about uh, automated alloy screening methods and afterwards my colleague Leonard will tell you something about extreme high speed laser application. So let's dig in, I would say. Um, for the motivation, you can see here uh, in the middle this control arm for a car. And um, you can see on the left side the microstructure of the conventional casting process. You can see that uh, the structure is pretty homogeneous. We have grains around 200 micrometers and more. And um, we have a pretty homogeneous orientation of all of these grains. If we take a look, at the additive microstructure, we can see a lot of differences to the conventional casting. We can see that we have a lot of dislocations. We can see a lot smaller grains and grains elongated in building direction. We can see segregations of different um, elements. And we can see a texture, a strong texture in building direction. Um, the thing is, we have two completely different processes, and so we achieve completely different microstructures. And this is why we need special tailored alloys, um, especially for additive manufacturing. If we look at the steel production um, on Earth, we can see here for 2008 that uh, we have a global demand of 1 billion um, tons, and we can see that there are more than 2,000 different steel grades. The thing is, 54% of these steel grades are flat products and 46% of these steel grades are long products. And where is the powder for additive manufacturing? So this was 2008 and by now the um, production of powder has increased, but the share of powder in um, the worldwide um, steel production is only at 1%. So we need a lot more powder production for additive manufacturing. Why is it so challenging to um, develop new alloys for additive manufacturing? Um, if we take like 90 processable elements into account, then when we just want to make a mixture of two different elements, we have over 4,000 different combinations um, we can produce. If we have three elements in a combination, we have over um, 117,000 um, possible combinations. And this goes on and on. So if we think of um, new alloys with 10 or more elements, we have a lot of combinations we need to screen and we need to find out which of these combinations are worth processing. And what we want to achieve is that we want to have materials produced with AM um, which have superior properties in um, contrast to pr uh, conventional processing. So what we are doing there is, if you take a look at this big red arrow, this is the time for conventional alloy development. And what we are doing is the rapid alloy development approach. We start with computational alloy screening, and afterwards we do high throughput screening and testing, so we come out with just a small number of processable um, alloys in the end. Um, let's take a look at our use case, just to make it a little bit more clear. Um, we have this turbine blade here on the monitor, and this turbine blade had, has different requirements. We can see that uh, we need high temperature stability, we need creep resistance, we need a low density, we need oxidation resistance, and in the end, we want to make it for AM, so we need processability in AM or in LPBF. 
These are the requirements we need, uh, we have for the material for this turbine blade. And the material currently used for this use case is nickel-based super alloy. We have the, in this example the nickel-based super alloy 247, and this is used in the conventional method, not in the AM method. This is used in the conventional method because we have a high content of gamma prime precipitation, and this um, ensures the stability, the high temperature stability and creep resistance. The problem there is we can use it in casting, but we cannot use it in AM, because in AM we have different cooling conditions, and so we have hot cracking in this material if we want to use it for a turbine blade. So it's not efficiently processable in additive manufacturing. What we do then is we take a look at the microstructure of this um, reference alloy, and so we can see that we have grains consisting of gamma phase, you can see it on the left, um, and we also have in between the grains on the grain boundaries we have gamma prime precipitation. What we also can simulate is the, um, are the different elements and how these elements will uh, segregate uh, to the grain boundaries. And what we do with that, this is the microstructure of the material, a little bit more schematic. Um, what we do with that is that we want to vary different elements of this reference alloy. So we take a look at the different elements. We see each of these elements has uh, its own task. For example, we have aluminium, titanium, and niobium. They, uh, are, uh, they, they, their task is to form these secondary phases, and their task is to form uh, to ensure the high temperature stability. We also have uh, tantalium and uh, tungsten, which are strong solution strengtheners, and we also have rhenium, which decreases um, the formation of cracking supporting phases. So what you see here is that we, va we vary all these different elements um, to a certain uh, value. And what we come up with then are, as it stands here, over 50,000 possible composition samples. So this is a lot, and we can't produce 50,000 different samples and then see in the end which is the best. So we start with computational alloy screening. Computational alloy screening consists of two main stages. We start with very easy, very fast equilibrium calculations, which will filter out the alloys which are totally not usable for our use case. So in the first stage, we just make a really rough filtering after very easy calculation models. Afterwards, we are left with around 10% of the uh, first 50,000 compositions, so we have 5,000 compositions left. And these go into stage two. In stage two, we use the slower but more precise calculation models to calculate the alloys which are, in the end, the most promising for additive manufacturing. What we also use here um, are reference alloys, in this case 21 reference alloys, which are alloys where we already know how processable they are. So we can compare the alloys that we screen with alloys where we already know that they work or that they don't work. And in the end, we are left with 5 to 127 five composition samples. Let's dig a bit deeper into the two stages. Um, let's start with stage one. We can go back and take a look at the different requirements um, we defined in the first place. And the f in the first stage, we want to filter after the necessary microstructures that are necessary for the use case. So in our case, it's the high temperature stability, which is the most important, and the processability in LPBF. So what we do, is that we set a threshold for a certain phase. In this case, it's the gamma prime phase. And we set a threshold there that we have a minimum of this phase in all the alloys which will be filtered out in the end. So this is the first threshold we set. The second threshold for the processability is that we set a maximum for phase fraction for phases which will support cracking. So we don't want cracking in LPBF, and this is why we say, okay, maximum 5% of these phases which will make cracking more, um, more possible in our alloy. So how this looks in the end, um, the, blue po the blue points are all the um, alloys we had in the first place, all the 50,000 alloys, and in this yellow square we can see the 
um, remaining 5,000 alloys which meet our thresholds we set in stage one. So we are in the middle here at the 5,000 something composition samples and now we go to stage two. In stage two, we use, as I said, the slower calculation models. And as you can see in the requirements, we have low density and oxidation resistance left. So we didn't meet all the requirements we want to uh, meet in the first place. And we still have to work on the processability because we only had like one parameter for the processability. So now we take different cracking parameters into account to ensure in the end that the LO we have filtered out will not crack in LPBF. This looks something like this. And uh, you can see the solidification interval. This is a parameter for cracking. And um, this needs to be very small, so cracking does not occur in our alloy. You can also see the 21 reference alloys, um, which are in green, uh, purple, yellow, and red. And from green to red, um, the processability decreases. So the green alloys are the ones where we know they are processable. The red ones are the ones where we know that they are not processable in additive manufacturing. We can see that most of the green ones are on the left side and most of the red ones are on the right side. So we can say in the end that we need a very small solidification interval. And so we set this cracking parameter to a very um, to a very uh, low number, so all these alloys which have a high solidification interval will be filtered out in this stage. What we also do is that we take uh, the Pareto optima of different uh, other parameters, for example, the density or the oxidation resistance, and um, there we can use just the optimum of uh, the alloys we want to filter out in the end. And so, in the end, we have all our requirements uh, met and are left with five to 127 um, different composition samples, depending on the Pareto Optima we set in the stage two. And uh, now Leonard will tell you what we are doing with the remaining five to 127 combinations. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Klaus, so far. Um, yeah, as Klaus mentioned, we're now down from 50,000 to approximately 100, and, uh, from 50,000 to 127 possible combinations. And the challenge for us on the experimental side is now how do we get down to uh, a lower number of uh, interesting combinations and uh, screen as many as possible physically. Now, the, the first thing why some type of new screening approach is needed is because of the um, AM feedstock material, which is typically powder of high quality, which needs to be customly atomized. So we have this created individual compositions which are not commercially available as powder material as of now. So the first thing we would need to do now is go into um, custom powder atomization. That's the process shown here. Um, it's, for small batches, extremely costly, uh, time-consuming, resource-consuming, and the powder that we receive from the gas optimization itself needs to be further uh, processed before we can actually start some type of experimental screening. Now, first step after powder production would be sieving. We would then go into a, a powder uh, qualification to ensure, our, uh, um, to ensure the powder quality for the process. And in the end, we would need to repeat this 127 times. And that is for uh, application-driven alloy development just not feasible and not affordable. Now, the, the possible challenge to overcome this is something uh, we call rapid alloy development. And the, the entire advantage we can see here. So first shown, we have the uh, conventional alloy development, meaning we create for each of the desired compositions our own custom powder. Uh, it's extremely uh, time and cost consuming, and this can partially be overcome by a rapid alloy development approach called dry mixing, meaning we have elemental powders for the desired composition, and then not rather than having a customly atomized powder, create a powder blend of the material that we want to investigate. Now, these um, powder blends are a good way, they save time. Uh, however, especially for powder bed processes, we have the overflow, we have the entire process chamber. Those need to be filled, and therefore there's a lot of powder lost. Plus, we don't have the exact same composition every particle. Now, um, taking this one step further and trying to save more time would be a process, an approach called in situ uh, alloy development, meaning we will 
uh, directly feed elemental uh, powders into a nozzle-based system and therefore don't create any powder blends um, separately. Meaning we produce through a DED process directly specimen with a desired composition without wasting any material. Now, the second challenge that we need to overcome here is um, we have developed this process for conventional DED, meaning we cannot directly transfer to laser powder bed fusion. Um, and the difference you can see in the, on the slide here, the DED is characterized by certain cooling rates in the, uh, in the marked region. And the cooling rate that we achieve in the process has a high impact on the received or produced microstructure. Now, unfortunately, the cooling rates of laser powder bed fusion do not really overlap with uh, those of DED processes, meaning using just DED as an AM emulator is not feasible. Now, a recent development is the ELA technology, which replicates a quite large um, range of the desired cooling rates, but that is unfortunately limited to rotationally symmetric parts to create the extreme feed rates. Now, um, we have a machine uh, just recently received for ELA 3D, and that is can be used, uh, which I will explain in a minute, as an AM emulator for high throughput screening, combining both worlds. So we have the local powder supply from DED systems in combination with the cooling rates that can be achieved in laser powder bed fusion. And what this machine will looks like um, is we'll have a look at that now. So it's a specially designed machine with a parallel kinematics which overcomes the uh, limitations of conventional kinematics which don't uh, allow these high feed rates which are required to achieve the desired cooling rates. And this is being uh, done through a parallel kinematic system that allows us feed rates in the range of up to 200 meters per minute and acceleration in all axes up to uh, 50 meters per second squared. Now, um, this machine, I'll show you a, a small process uh, video here. Um, the powder is being fed locally through into the nozzle where it's molten inside the, the melt pool and it allows thin vault structures and bulk material as well of um, individual compositions and some uh, samples of produced parts that have been printed already on this type of machine um, are shown here. So one is the bulk material which is interesting for sample production and investigation and on the other, on the right hand side, we have a thin-walled aluminum structure, uh, which is um, a development for uh, aluminum applications. Now, this machine allows us, as I said, to replicate the processing conditions and build an AM emulator. And the second challenge here is now, how do we get the desired powder mixture into the process? So, we said we, we have the replicated the cooling conditions, we're emulating for example, in LPBF process, and the powder is being fed into the nozzle. Now, the question is, how do we get the powder into the nozzle on, in the right moment? Um, the first step that we there have, have here in our advanced mixing system um, is a mixing unit, which is being fed from a cyclone. And uh, that's a, it's the gas or the material is always being fed through a mixture of gas and powder. And the cyclone is there to um, eliminate excess feeding gas that's too much for the process. Um, before that, we have a powder switch which can uh, determine the, the powder flow into an overflow uh, container to save powder and to switch into the cyclone and the on, uh, ongoing feeding system only in the moments where we actually need powder in the process. That's uh, powder saving for the, all the times where the process is not running or that we need to stabilize the powder feeding. And the powder feeding is done through individual powder hoppers. And the mixing unit that I mentioned now, uh, the reason why we have it is, um, you can see it now on the bottom of the slide. Instead of just having one of these powder feeding systems, we are feeding up to eight of these uh, powder lines. And that is also the key reason why we need the cyclones. Each powder line accumulates a certain amount of needed feeding gas, and the feeding gas is one of the key parameters to influence particle velocity on the way to the substrate. Now, if we are accumulating too much feeding gas, we need to reduce it somehow, and that's a development that uh, 
it has come up with with the cyclones to use the cyclone to carefully or precisely adjust the gas flow that determines finally the particle speed when they leave the nozzle and enter the uh, weld welding process. Now, what does this look like in reality? Um, we can see here on the very left side the individual powder hopper, so it's acrylic uh, clear containers where the elemental powders are being put into. Um, the powder hoppers feed the powder actually into our machine. Uh, for each powder, we have an individual powder switch um, on the uh, upper left-hand side, and then the powder goes either into the cyclone on the right or in the, ho on the collecting container on the bottom, or it's being fed into the uh, mixing unit on the bottom right. Now, from the mixing unit, um, we feed the powder into the machine, and the combination of these two things, the fast handling system together with our uh, individual or advanced powder feeding system, allows us to emulate um, LPBF processing conditions uh, in our uh, ELA device. Now, what's the actual advantage of it when we're looking into material screening and uh, sample production? Uh, what we have here is the state of the art for screening um, individual material and laser powder bed fusion. So we have we can build multiple individual specimen for further investigation on one build plate, but due to the global powder supply, we are limited to one chemical composition. Meaning, if we have 127 materials to screen, we would have to do this 127 times. The only flexibility that we have here is the energy input that we can actually adjust for each um, sample. So it is feasible for parameter development, but not for material development. Now, with our machine, this is what's possible. We can not only adjust the chemical, uh, not only adjust the heat input or the process parameters for each sample, but also change the chemical composition for each and every sample, meaning the 127 combinations that we have come up with so far in the digital screening can be much more easily screened in less build jobs with this system. And that's the, the absolute key advantage that, that has been developed here. Now, one thing is influencing chemical composition and assuming that we have the same energy input, the same processing conditions and as in laser bed powder fusion. But the entire approach is only feasible uh, and valid if we can ensure that the processing conditions that we produce in this machine can be compared or are similar to in the desired later on applications such as laser bed powder bed fusion. Now, the way we do this in this machine is it is equipped with a wide range of monitoring and preparation systems to uh, precisely adjust and control the processing conditions that we have in, inside our um, specimen or that has been exposed to the specimen. Now, the first thing is a Vixel system. It's a local preheating system, a diode of laser arrays that um, allows to preheat samples uh, that are in production um, pre precisely and locally. So it's not a global heating system, um, but rather a, a, you can almost imagine as a picture from individual uh, heat uh, pixels that where each can be controlled precisely and separately to in, to adjust the local temperature. Um, then we have in the machine uh, two laser line scanners. Uh, one is shown here, the other is in the parking position. So the laser line scanners are used to um, verify the geometric accuracy of our build jobs. Uh, meaning in between uh, each layer it is possible to get a three-dimensional um, model of the part that's being printed at the moment and that is done through uh, two laser line scanners depending on the material and depending on the reflectivity. Uh, we use a different laser beam wavelength to scan the parts. Um, Next system that we have available is a pyrometer. It's a high-speed pyrometry uh, system that allows us to monitor the temperature inside the melt pool. So we monitor directly the, the, the process itself um, at 10 kilohertz to ensure the, the cooling rates and the temperature in the melt pool and, and the processing area are as desired. 
Now, there's two, uh, three more systems that I want to mention that are available on this system for material development. Uh, first thing is our infrared camera. It allows thermal imaging, uh, and that's especially of interest for monitoring the entire energy household of the produced samples in general. So how does the specimen or the part that we are printing cool down in general, and how does it heat up? Especially during the beginning of the process, um, we see that we start with a cold substrate plate and then we have a continuous heat build up through the process energy that we are putting into the system. Um, or if the part is preheated with the Vixel system, then for the times we are, when we are in process, we expect cool down and that can be monitored with the infrared camera. Now the next system that I want to mention is the high-speed camera that's uh, available where we can uh, take pictures of the process itself, meaning we can see uh, single particles on their way when they leave the nozzle at approximately six meters per second and hit the substrate. There is a gap of one to 1.5 centimeters where the, the particles travel um, through air or through shielding gas onto the substrate. And what is happening to these particles when, while they are preheated, how they are leaving the nozzle, that can be monitored with a high-speed uh, imaging system. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention there is the LIPS. Um, as I said, we are mostly focused on producing specimen of different chemical compositions. Um, the LIPS system allows us to easily uh, check the chemical composition of our samples uh, after production. So we can directly go into analysis, have we seen evaporation for certain elements, have we hit the desired composition, or do we see maybe unmixing or uh, other effects in the process that are not desired. That's the, the system as we have it now in the moment. And something that I want to put on now is how do we, um, how, what does it look like in reality when we've produced our first results? Now, the thing that we started with in the beginning were simulations of the microstructure and the elemental distribution for certain elements in the uh, chosen al alloying system. Now, this is what we have uh, simulated, and this is what we've seen in the experiments that have been conducted so far. And I would say that we are at the moment quite close to getting a, a nice loop there in linking experimental and simulation data for the experiments and, uh, that have been conducted so far. Yeah. That's the, uh, the end of our presentation, and I want to just close with a short summary. So we've seen why is it important to develop custom materials for additive manufacturing? We are facing entirely different processing conditions, and so far it is common practice to use long-known materials which have, developed, have been developed for entirely different applications. And the market of uh, additive manufacturing is growing, and there are some custom, customly designed alloys, but very few. And the main challenge has been so far the extreme amount of work that is required to come up with new suitable uh, elemental compositions. And that is our new approach to come overcome this by first using digital methods to reduce the po number of possible compositions in a way that we can finally screen those that we have come up with. So um, we have seen the machine that is capable of emulating AM uh, technologies and screening different materials. And the result of that is printing multiple specimen on one build plate with different chemical compositions and therefore uh, rapidly accelerating the alloy development process. Now, last step, we've uh, seen that experimental data is matching our um, simulations so far. And we are now in the process of um, finally producing specimen and then later on testing uh, with mechanical testing the produced specimen. Yeah, thank you so far for, for your attention. Um, the research uh, that we do has been uh, uh, mostly funded by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in multiple different uh, process uh, projects that are shown here, and the machine has been funded by the uh, DFG. Yeah, thank you for your attention, and um, we're there to take your questions. First of all, a big applause. Thank you so much. Two of you, Klaus Leonard, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much.
Any question? Well, we have quite a big audience. Any questions from the audience so far <laughs> through the whole process? If not, I do have a one. But I leave it, leave it first to you. If not, how many, I mean, uh, honestly, I'm not an expert, and you exceeded far my knowledge of alloy development, but how many people are involved in such a project? Because uh, we, have, we see the two of you, but how many people are behind? In all projects mentioned, yeah. I would say more than how many are in, in campus? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say if, like if, if we just mention our groups, maybe like 50 in to 100, something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 So But directly working here, I would say around 20. Not bad. So you are currently researching and, uh, and pushing that topic forward. At, at what point do you cooperate with industry or where comes industry in place? Is that at a, at a certain point where you talk to uh, end users in the industry about your development? Or it is. It, the interest is growing a lot. People face the challenge that the available materials are not suitable. They are interested in custom or application uh, optimized materials. Those are not available, but still, so far, it has been the main concern. It is too costly, too time efficient uh, to come up with custom materials for smaller applications. So that interest is definitely growing. But I can add for the computational part that um, to find parameters to screen something, uh, we have a lot of input from industry that we know the requirements, so we can't uh, just say from our own expertise that these requirements are useful for this material or something. So um, the industry gives us some, some input that we can use in the screening, so it's, they are already uh, involved in certain steps of the screening process. Klaus, you mentioned at the very beginning the use case of the turbine blades. Uh, is that something after research that is now feasible or is it still uh, undoable in additive manufacturing? I mean, this is how you started, right? Uh, it is feasible to produce turbine blades with additive manufacturing. Um, I think it will take a lot of research and a lot of time to produce them uh, in a way to make turbines a lot more efficient than they are right now. Yeah. So that it's really uh, useful for industry to use additive uh, manufactured turbine blades and not the turbine blades casted. So you got a lot of input from the industry, that's as far as I got, in order to validate and to, to get more data, especially for the computational side. Um, what I mean, it's now you are getting closer to your results, and the test results are already quite promising. Um, is it now the stage where you say we are looking for use cases here in the industry? Is that why you're here at Form Next, or what is the purpose then of uh, it's, being presented it's, here? It's definitely there to promote the technology. It's available for industrial applications, and we would be ready to screen more materials, definitely. Okay. Very good. And what about the, let's say, the material provider? Because we're talking a lot about materials here at Form Next. Uh, they're doing their researches as well. Are they approaching you in order to, uh, let's say, step into such a research to fund you additionally? Is that, is that a topic from the industry that's coming up? Or? Yes, definitely. Yeah? Actually, in the project uh, where we do the uh, computational screening, we uh, have uh, powder providers and uh, uh, material providers in the uh, research team uh, directly uh, themselves in there, so uh, they are already in the in the system. And yep. then let me allow the last last question because it's, you see Go it ahead. is it is interesting. I hope it's okay <laughs> for you. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if we compare now material developers in in the industry compared with your work, who is then? A step ahead, let's, let me put it that way. So if you are, let's say you are developing alloys, uh, uh, like uh, many companies do, are they quicker than you are in your research projects or are you, are you a step ahead? So are you, uh, is there kind of a competition? Or I would say with this machine technology, we are at least one step ahead since there are not that many of these machines in the world. So um, for this approach, we're definitely ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Thank Super you. interesting to have you here. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much for being our guest. Big applause for Klaus and Lennart. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very See much. See you at your booth. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this was uh, quite interesting. Uh, we come to our last session block, I would say, at the third day of the Form Next 2022. We will tackle again. 
a little bit the topic of sustainability as it's quite important. And before we do so, and I can promise you we have an excellent lineup of speaker and a very interesting uh, panel discussion at the very end uh, before, we, we, before we go into the afterwork session, we will provide you with some more highlights of this year's Form Next. So please stay tuned. We, I will see you in a couple of minutes back here on stage. Thank you so much. <laughs>